What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mike Zuniga Films Podcast. In this episode, I have with me Callie Turner. She's a filmmaker and creative director at Ariel Produced, a video production company that focuses on promoting great causes. She also shares in this episode how she went from dropping out of college to pursue filmmaking to now producing one of her biggest projects to date for the British Virgin Islands that was affected by Hurricane Irma in her BVI Strong documentary and BVI Stronger series. So without further ado, Callie Turner. Thanks again for being on the podcast, Callie. I really appreciate it. And um, I know that you have a lot of great things to share, especially your filmmaking story. So I wanted to first start by asking, you know, how did you get into filmmaking? Was it something that you were interested in the beginning or was it something that developed over time? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is an incredible experience to be able to share my story. Um, I have not been in filmmaking my whole life. I actually was in school for business. That is what I knew I wanted to do uh, since I was a kid. I've been studying real estate. And so I came up to Nashville, Tennessee. I'm from South Carolina. And I would work with my sister in her real estate company um, every summer from 14 to 18. Mm -hmm. And then I went off to college. I said, I don't know what I want to do yet, but I'm going to go study business, psychology, and Spanish so I can just be useful in the world. (laughs) And um, (laughs) that's basically it. And I was like, one day I'll figure out what it is, but I've got time. And so my sister, Brittany, the one that owns the, the real estate company said, come intern for me one more year. And I was like, ah, but like, I really, I think I want to go to California and intern for this app development company. I think that's what I want to do. And she was like, no, 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 come work for me. And so I did. And uh, I worked in what's called special projects, which is another word for does everything. And so I still wasn't like really figuring out what I wanted to do. I'd I got to work with the accountants. I got to work in real estate and uh, in sales. And then she actually went out of town for two weeks and dropped a massive project on me and didn't tell me because that's kind of how she teaches people. She makes you really struggle and stress (laughs) and stress out before you realize you're capable of doing something. Uh And so she left for two weeks and said, I need two uh, commercials made for our multifamily projects, which are apartment complexes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, commercials? I've never even made a video in my entire life. I was like, how do I, what? And so I just started doing a lot of research. And Uh I was like, well, what do theirs look like? What did I like about theirs? What did I not like about theirs? And then we're like, well, we need a videographer. Well, we need a photographer. Uh, We need some models. (laughs) Make sure it's diverse. And it was like, and after that, we just started putting it together. We scheduled it. We got everybody together, and uh, I acted and modeled in it, and directed and videoed it. Nice. <laughs> of course, we had some help, but I didn't know what I was doing with the camera yet. So mm-hmm. mostly, it was in front of it. But that's how it all started. Is it ended up being really successful, and she loved it. And she said, I want you to do more of these. And I actually want you to drop out of school and help me start a production company. And I was wow. like, wow, okay, you, <laughs> you, you found like way too far ahead of yourself. I was like, this is literally the first video I've ever made. Um, but I, I've always loved the idea of resetting standards or mm-hmm. just being the example of something that you wish you saw. And so my parents were very adamant about instilling self-confidence and uniqueness. And Mm -hmm. so we were homeschooled my whole life. And I think that helped translate into when I got into high school and I actually went to public school, I would see all these trends that I didn't like, but then how do you become a trendsetter or like reset standards for how you want to see them? You have to be them. And I think that media is the strongest tool to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just a great tool for marketing, but it's a great tool for uh, making culture the way you want it to, to look like. And so, I mean, just think about it. What are you taking in every day? How does that make your brain think? What do you feel? What do you, what's normal to you? It's what you see every day. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about it and I was like, well, that's what I love to do. And I can just learn the media stuff later. 
I'm just right. gonna I'm just gonna understand how powerful it is and then learn it and figure out how to do it later. And so that's what I did. I had already paid for a whole other next year of college and my apartment and everything was locked in. I was super motivated to go back. I was like adding a couple things to my major and I just dropped out <laughs> and I moved to Nashville and we started this company and it started really slow. I was, I think like my first job title was social media strategist and I was basically just running all the social media accounts, mm -hmm. but that's the best place to start because you're like, how do I tell a story every day? And it's, it's so low risk because you told the story about that day and if it sucked, you got next day to do it. You know, you're not taking on these mass projects. So I think that's a great place for people to start in media. It's just by starting in social media and then working your way up to uh, larger positions. And that's what happened. I went from social media to brand strategist to, um, to production assistant to videographer to editor to, to actually creating all the content. Mm -hmm. And then I went to creative director and I was directing all the people that had a lot more years of experience in all of those fields that I dabbled in. Right. And so that's where I'm at now. And uh, that's a summary of my, my film story. But the, the next large video that I ever made was actually a documentary about the British Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. After they got hit by Hurricane Irma, uh, it's a really long story and I'll only tell it if you ask, <laughs> but we basically realized that for countries that small in the middle of the Caribbean, the British Virgin Islands population under 30,000, they don't get help after they go through something like a category five. The only thing that helps them is if people come back on vacation mm -hmm. and people only come back on vacation if they think that it's still okay. The last thing that the news said was that they were absolutely destroyed and that there were prisoners running around killing everybody. Literally, that's what we saw in America. So after spending a week and a half down there, four days after the hurricane, which is really not smart or safe to do, <laughs> we realized they're not going to get help. The best mm -hmm. way that we can help is to keep their story alive and make a short documentary. And so that's what we did. And then after the documentary, we realized we have to keep going. We have to tell their story in depth because they're amazing people and people don't know how to help. Can, like for as long as I can remember, this is what happens. Does that natural disasters happen? People freak out. They post about it on Facebook. They pray. And then a week later, you forget about it because something else bad happens in the world. Mm -hmm. And so if we can keep the story alive and, and raise awareness for this place years down the road, which I just have not seen anyone doing, then we can really make some long lasting impact. So I had a lot of learning to do after I'd sign myself up for a documentary. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we executed the documentary, literally me and my sister, and we had some help from a couple other people. I think you know who D-Rock is? Yeah, yeah, with yeah. Gary Vee. Yeah, I flew up to New York and I, I saw D-Rock for a day. I, I saw him for 30 minutes, actually. <laughs> and then I, I flew back home. Yeah, it was the shortest trip to, to New York ever. And I asked him two days before I went if I could come see him and if he would watch my documentary. Probably like the most courageous thing I had done thus far because it was not good. <laughs> it oh, was okay. really, really not far along. There's a big difference between draft one and draft Five, mm -hmm. and he saw it at draft one <laughs> well but that says something though i think right you know yeah. if, if he if he likes it at draft one then you know draft five is gonna be exceptional so well i hope so because a lot more work was put into it after mm -hmm. and i think it was a lot better but that was my first major project and then it got promoted by richard branson it got promoted by the premier of the country which is the president Mm -hmm. And it got um, over a million views, like all together from Richard Branson's site and YouTube. BVI Strong is the main documentary, right? And BVI Stronger yeah. is the full on series. Yeah. Um, I think I came, across, uh, I, I came across like one of those videos. Um, and uh -huh. then I saw you as the person that posted it. And I was like, oh, this is very cool. Um, yeah. 
and I wanted to know more about you as a filmmaker. That's why I reached out. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, that was great. Everything you shared was awesome. So kind of want to backtrack just a little bit okay. and then we'll come to where you are now as a film, filmer, filmer for uh-huh. BVI Strong and BVI Stronger. Okay. So in terms of school, when you yeah. went there and you majored in business, yeah, how did that help you? Did that help you in any way in terms of translating that into what you do now? Um, I had only finished my prereqs. And so I actually wasn't learning business. I had done everything to get myself to the point where I would start learning. Uh-huh. And then I left. <laughs> and so... I would say no, but what Mm -hmm. it did do for me is it got rid of the what if in my head. I knew, I know what it's like to be in college and I know how different it is. Mm -hmm. I think had I not gone to college for that one year, I would have continuously asked what if, and it would have been a lot harder to stick with the choice I made to stay here. And I made a lot of great friends and it was was definitely worth it. Mm -hmm. I feel like a waste at all. Yeah. So, I mean, there's positives with going to college. I mean, connections, like you said, are very important. Yeah. Yeah. And you just got to ask yourself what you want. I mean, if I had somebody, if I was listening to this podcast and I was 18 and I was deciding whether or not to go to college, I would say, ask yourself what you want out of Mm -hmm. college. Mm -hmm. And if it's, and if it's the experience and it's making friends and it's gaining resources and it's growing as a person yeah, you're going to get that, but you can honestly get that anywhere. If you're focused and you're not actually like a lazy person by nature, Mm -hmm. you can go use that money, travel the world, meet incredible people, develop a network that way, build your skills, work for free, and you're going to learn so much and you're going to develop as a person. And I think you're going to expose yourself to a lot more and find what you want to do much quicker than you would Mm -hmm. by essentially being in this small network of people. Right. But there are some people that really need their degree and they want to be a doctor or a lawyer and you have to go to school. (laughs) Like there's just no way. Yeah. There's some where there's like no exceptions. Yeah. I'm definitely an advocate for school when it comes to something like that. Like you need it, but I just look at it as, and I don't know if this is because I was homeschooled and like Mm -hmm. just learning was so different for me it was learn what you want to learn at the pace you can and be motivated by the reward that you are a better more intelligent person more capable person rather than you're going to get a good grade so you can go do something else it's always about a number when I went into public school and I was like Mm -hmm. I hate this I'm not actually learning I'm just learning the system and so um yeah, so college wasn't for me for that reason, but it was in the sense that I I definitely saw myself like cultivating relationships and that's really important to me. And being around people my age was important for me. Right. But you don't need it. I think we're moving into a generation that understands that, mm-hmm. like a new new era where people just they look at learning differently and there's so mm-hmm. many more opportunities to learn that they're not just looking at school and that really excites me. Because I think that YouTube's going to be one of the next universities. You know, funny you said that. That was one of the biggest things that taught me how to film. YouTube. It, yeah, it, it was a great um, teaching oh. tool for sure. I owe YouTube a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. And specifically for you, after you dropped out of college Uh picked up the camera how did you learn to use it what were some uh ways that you because i know we're talking about youtube was there any ways uh that you invested in to better your craft absolutely um you know I've, i've actually never taken a class on filmmaking i've never taken or really even hung out with people that film and just watched them Mm-hmm. I have studied bloggers and <clears throat> I've watched Casey Neistat since day one. I've watched D rock since day one and just seeing what do I like, what looks nice and then figuring out how to do that. And I think 
And then I still force myself to watch editing tutorials every week, even if I think I know how to do that, just to open my mind to say that's possible. And so I force myself to find new people every week to fill my feed and my timeline with newer and better content. Not because I think I'm going to learn how to do it that second, but I'm going to realize that that's possible. No, you can actually make a shot look like that. Okay, now how do we go do it? And most of the time you can figure it out and, and you don't even have to, have to have the best gear. Because mm-hmm. so many people have the best gear, but they don't know how to use it. And you might as well be using your iPhone because you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's really where like my film career started was on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. Because everything, when we started going down there in the BVI, everything was shot on iPhone. Really? Yeah, we thought we were going to get robbed and killed because that's Mm. what the the news was telling us. Mm -hmm. Even on our way down through Puerto Rico, they said, don't go. You guys are stupid. Wow. Why? I mean, Puerto Rico is like a 30-minute plane ride away, and they didn't even know. Wow. Yeah, so didn't bring a camera. I brought a drone and an iPhone. Mm -hmm. I didn't even bring a computer to load the footage. (laughs) So like all the footage is being loaded to my phone, poor phone. Oh man. But you made it happen though. But that's what I realized is like, you don't need professional everything. You don't need the best mics and cameras and you really just need to be able to, to set up a shot and to ask the right questions and to like, and to capture the right moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's my style is like, is really capturing the heart of things and doing documentary style things when it when it gets really technical into um just like cinematography and beautiful things like that you need better gear like gimbals and things like that to just keep it steady and look professional but uh but yeah i definitely don't think you need to have the best gear just learning what is possible and then figuring out how to do that or whether it's a person training you or you're getting on YouTube every day and you're just watching everything you can and Mm -hmm. then practicing your craft every day after that. Uh That's the only way you're going to get better. Some people, I mean, you can pick up on it really quickly. Some people, they have to practice for years. Mm -hmm. It all depends, right? Yeah. I would never really compare yourself to someone else. They're like, oh, I've been doing this for eight years. You could probably learn it in a month. Mm-hmm. Someone else, I've been doing this for six months. Might take you a year. Yeah, it just, I, I definitely think that it's like a natural skill, but you can learn it. Right. And speaking yeah. of style, how did you develop your style as a filmmaker? Because I think every filmmaker, for the most part, you have to know the basics, right? Uh, mm-hmm. in, ter- in terms of like structure and, and whatnot. But eventually over time, you develop your own style. So, How did you develop your your style? Definitely by watching people, other people, and seeing what I liked and didn't like. And then wishing they did something differently. That's kind of when you're like, I mean, if you don't have a lot of things to be working on, watch Mm -hmm. other people's stuff and just critique it yourself and take notes Mm -hmm. yourself and say, it would have been way cooler if they did that. And Mm -hmm. then take somebody else's footage and just keep practicing. What I've actually done is taken videos <clears throat> downloaded them and then edited them a way that I kind of wish it would have been edited and make it like way more me or just way better and Interesting. giving it back to that person. I'm like, Hey, this is what I would have done. And, uh, I think that's a great way to start is just by practicing on a lot of different types of filming and see if you can get a style there because you can use other people's footage that they shot with their mind and intentions. Mm-hmm and you can still make it look like your work, then you've really got your style down. That's that's an interesting thing that you said because I haven't heard that one before. And I think that a lot of filmmakers that are just starting out, I think one fear that they have is I might be copying this person, right? But I think over time, as long as you, you develop your own style um, or seeing what they're doing like you said Mm -hmm. and kind of applying that as an aspect to what you do Mm -hmm. you're eventually gonna differentiate yourself yeah right yeah i mean there's a lot of things i think i have to sacrifice like cinematography wise in Mm -hmm. order to get the whole story in because 90 percent of the time i'm like 
I need these eight clips to just tell you what happened versus this one beautiful slow motion shot. And, mm. and I think that's like kind of what's developed my style too, is more just like, how do you tell the story in a short period of time when it could have been this long mm-hmm. and still make it look good? And, um, yeah, yeah. And that's so, a tricky part. Yeah. But a lot of, some people only know how to make something look good, but they don't really know how to tell a story. And so just challenging yourself to practice both, you'll mm-hmm. be a much better filmmaker and you'll be more valuable to any team. Yeah. So speaking of story, um, what do you think is missing in stories nowadays when it comes to video? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think truth is missing. <laughs> I think that media is used now mainly to make money and what makes money and what sells mm-hmm. is, you know, hot topics. It's drama. It's over-exaggeration. And something that I really want to do in my lifetime is is be a director and a creator, producer, whatever, of reality TV that doesn't have the bad rap of reality TV. And mm-hmm. it's reality TV, TV that actually, like, you watch it to be inspired, to be motivated to do everything that you are capable of doing and to actually help you get there. And that's like why I want to study psychology and why I want to just understand people so that I can help them through media be able to understand themselves better and and take them to a higher place. And so I think that um yeah, everybody lacks truth and, and they're so focused on what sells and what do people demand and until we start creating things that surpass that, that are better than that and show that that's actually in demand, then people are just going to stay in the same cycle. Mm-hmm. And it's like culture absolutely worships on Instagram these girls that, you know, promote themselves and like honestly – a really racy way and then it promotes the guys and the entrepreneurs that are like kissing their rolex watches and like (laughs) sitting in their lambos and i'm like that's so it's fake you Mm -hmm. know and and i don't understand why that's normal but while we continue to do it it's always going to be normal so i think they lack truth and depth and like authenticity everyone's trying to just do something else somebody else did better and i think people are afraid to do something differently yeah there's a there's a lot of truth in what you said for sure (laughs) but (laughs) nice you know piggybacking off of that um aside from truth and also authenticity what do you think uh makes a great story for video uh, what I think makes a great story is, um, I mean, for me, I think it, it, this comes back to like truth and auth- authenticity, but you'll mm-hmm. see in BVI Stronger, the characters go from Richard Branson to the Rasta man on the side of the street that I never even knew his name. I literally just like was sneak videoing him with my phone because I was so inspired by his conversation. And it's not planned. It's spontaneous. It's real. <clears throat> and I think that's what tells a great story because we all, all want to feel like we're a part of someone else's life and that things aren't always staged and they're not fake and, and you get to be a part of a genuine experience. And so when you can show moments like that, that are straight from the heart, that mm-hmm. are just raw and natural like that, that's the kind of media that and the stories that I want to be a part of. Right. Yeah. And I and I saw that when I was watching the the documentary and the series, the one thing that really uh, caught my attention was the one man who had to hide um, in that little. Oh um, my goodness, Albert! Oh, yeah, um, yeah. And he was saying that he wanted to go to his truck, right, and oh, hide yeah. in there, but he said a voice in his head told him uh-huh. to go hide um under um uh, under how would you explain it it's like he a... said well i could probably quote anything from any of these episodes because i've 
heard their voice so much, but he said, uh-huh. a voice told me as I was going to go out in the Jeep and it was parked there still, just go in the Jeep and ride it out for the rest of the storm. It's a 2000 pound Jeep, mm-hmm. something like that. Maybe 5,000. He said, but a voice told me go under the house and go now. And on his way to get under the house, he watches his Jeep slide down the cement like ice and tumble down the mountain. Absolutely insane. So yeah. what were you going to say about What were you going to say about so, that? So, yeah. And, and what I was going to say is just hearing that in its rawness, it, it really, you know, um, made me feel closer to him and his story in the mm-hmm. way that it was shot and the way that he was able to tell his story in that sense. And I also like, um, you know, what you were saying, you... In that, in that documentary, you're able to get the stories from all aspects of all the inhabitants of that island. You yeah. know, from Richard Branson to the, the cooks to mm-hmm. the owner of the yacht um, company. Yeah, Charter um, Jack. Yeah, and, you know, just hearing all of their stories, it really, for some reason, it fit together into one big story i don't know it, yeah. it was it it, it it was cool how it was like put together um but just like the realness and the rawness of it it made you feel closer to the people of the island so yeah 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 and that's the whole point is to make you relate to these people and to care about these people like we care about them being there in the flesh and mm-hmm. because there are people deserving and they need help <laughs> and so right. Yeah, I I love that you noticed that. So, um, how 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 did you get that project? Um, in terms of, because I know you're you're based in your company's based in Tennessee. Yeah. But that's all the way in the British Virgin Islands. How are you able to get that project? Is even even as the first project, right, for you? Um, first large project like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I work in real estate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's keep that in mind. My sister, Brittany is trying to buy a piece of land in the British Virgin Islands. Okay. So in January, 2017, nine months before the hurricane, I went down there for the first time to grab the four shots because she's going to purchase it, renovate it, and then turn it into a business. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Essentially, I mean, it's a long vision that I'd have to explain and it's confidential, but mm-hmm. um, she wants to make it a global hub for people to come from all around the world and uh, basically brainstorm how to change the world. <laughs> and uh, so it's got an awesome vision to it. And I went to go grab before shots. After she renovated, I was going to be part of the whole process and and telling the story through like a, a little YouTube series and what it looks like to renovate a piece of land in the British Virgin Islands. Mm-hmm. And so when the hurricane hit, she said, oh, that that's going, that hurricane's going right over the land, uh, you know, in the BVI. And I was like, oh my gosh, no, that's so sad. Not knowing what was really going to happen. And then when mm-hmm. it happened, we saw pictures and videos and we were like, we have to go do something about this. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I have no idea what, but <laughs> we stayed up. We basically stayed up two, three days in a row, just packing. And we brought computers for people who lost their businesses. We brought tons of relief. Um, I think we brought 500 pounds of gear with us, just like wow. food and stuff, expecting mm-hmm. all of it to get taken, but we brought it anyway. And uh, a lot of stuff did get taken and like, uh-huh. between the airports and stuff, but, uh-huh. uh, but not all of it. And so anyways, we got there and uh, um, fell in love with the people. I had not really spent much time there before. Mm-hmm. I would just spent time, you know, with her for work, but in situations like that, I mean, there is no rich, there's no poor, there's no black, there's no white, there's no religious, no political. Everybody is just, there to survive and really be a community and i had never seen anything like it and it was absolutely amazing and so that's when we just decided to do the documentary and to keep 
the story alive and say, you know, if this is a place where you want to buy land and you want to potentially, you know, be a part of this country long term, then we're going to invest in it because this mm -hmm. is basically your second home. And, uh, and so we just treated it like it was our own country and mm -hmm. they were our people. And that's exactly what it's turned into. I mean, that is yeah. my second home now. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, I have so many friends there and people I would call family and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's basically just, what's the next idea? Let's do it. I have no idea how to do that, but we've gone back seven to 10 days every month since the hurricane. So I've, I've, I've lived there not consecutively, uh, probably four months <laughs> and, uh, yeah, all together, not consecutively. I've lived there for like four months. So it's a second home, uh -huh. but that's how it all started. It was just going down there to get like before pictures. And I'm really glad I got those before pictures now. Cause there's <laughs> going to be a super renovation yeah. after hurricane Irma. Um, but yeah, we just, we go down there every, every month for about a week and, that's the difference that most people go down there. They help for five days and then they leave. And that's, that's most mission work in general. And that's, mm -hmm. but we're in it for the long haul and we have come back every month to prove that and to really be there for the people and do all we can. Yeah. So that project, um, it's very close to you and your family for sure, because you have, yeah. um, you know, you have a hand in that. Um, mm -hmm. Originally, you thought it was just going to be a few pictures, but it turned out to yeah. be a full-on documentary. Yeah. So, as a filmmaker, how did you grow throughout that whole documentary process? Oh, my gosh. Well, this is a documentary that is not making money, you know, I mean, when, when we started, it wasn't to make money, it was to help the people. And so step one, I became a lot more disciplined and hardworking. My work ethic really grew because I had to work on everything after hours. It was, you work till five and then you work on that till midnight every night and just figuring out how to solve problems that you never thought you'd have and figure things out that you have no experience in and you have no help with was extremely challenging, <clears throat> but I think that it's made me a better person, you know, not just from, I mean, a lot visiting the British Virgin Islands and being around those people and seeing what they've gone through is life changing enough, but then being consistent in a project that takes this much of your time, this much of your energy, your emotional energy and challenging you this much has really grown me. Mm -hmm. Honestly, think I could take on any task because there's <laughs> like, I, I'm like, I, after finishing this, this series, I'm like, I could go work for the president because there is not one thing I can't find on YouTube. I can't find a person to come teach me. And that's, I don't know how else I would learn that. <laughs> you, you know, you just got to jump in, you know, it, it's even if you feel like, okay, I, there's so much going on. I might not be up for the task. And, you know, the one great thing about you is you were like, all right, I'll do it. And one thing led to the, to the other. And, you know, here you are today creating a full-on documentary for BBI. Yeah. And uh, I just think that's what it looks like. It's people want to do great things. They want to make a difference. And it's not, you know, going to look normal. It's gonna, not going to be easy. I mean, there were nights where I pulled all nighters like several times a week just to get something done. Because if you take too many breaks, <clears throat> if you take too many breaks, then you know, you, you lose focus, you lose track. And then if there's more people and their time you have to take, then, you know, you're just never going to have to make time for it. And I think so many people are just like, I just don't have time for that. Or I'd like, ah, uh, like I would, but I'm involved in this. And it's like, you're never going to have time to do these things, but it's when you make it a priority and you stop making up excuses and you become more efficient in your life, then you will make time for it. So everything else had to fall into place. Like I just had to be more organized with my time, with my friends, with my boyfriend, with 
my family. I had to cut out all extra things that weren't making me more equipped to do this thing that I wanted to do. Like mm. I stopped watching Netflix a very long time ago <laughs> <laughs> and I stopped just doing things that weren't making me who I wanted to be and not getting me to the place where I wanted to go. And I became very focused. Yeah, exactly. And you know, that that's very important because you have to put your foot down and if it, this is something that you really want to do, like you said, you have to be disciplined and yeah. take the necessary steps to, you know, really stay organized and focus on what you need to do. Because if you keep procrastinating and putting it off to tomorrow, yeah. it's never going to happen. Yep. Ever. And that's like, so you can always argue that you're like, well, what does it make a difference if this video doesn't get out in the next two days, it gets out next week. <clears throat> and it's so easy to do that. I watch myself do it all the time. And I'm like, this is why it matters. And this is why you have to do this. Maybe it's just because you set a goal, but that's mm -hmm. what makes you better. Because if you can start doing things, if you can push yourself out of your creative bubble and still get things done, that's awesome. Because as creatives, we want to have like the most perfect environment. We want to have enough sleep. We want to be alone in the room or we want to be in a room with a lot of uh things going on it's like it has to be perfect and curated for us to be in our creative bubble and i'm like i learned how to get out of that really quick because there were so many times where i was sleep deprived i was starving i was like i you just didn't have the luxury i mean it, we're down in bvi and you can't cook and because there's no electricity so you're like surviving off granola bars you haven't showered in five days you're being eaten alive by mosquitoes mm -hmm. and you still have to make this daily vlog to tell what happened that day and be creative and it's three in the morning and you're like this is the complete opposite of <laughs> you know situation that i'd want to be in to do any of this creative work mm -hmm. but if you can still do it then then you can do it anywhere and i think that's like that's the main skill that creatives don't grow is how to stay creative when you're pressured when mm -hmm. you you know, because people say, oh, I just don't do well with, time, with deadlines. And I'm like, well, then you're never going to work for anyone because everyone's going to give you a deadline. And I honestly think it makes you better. If, I mean, some people thrive off pressure. Some people are crushed by it. But if you can figure out how to be just as good in both, you're going to be a freaking rock star. You can do anything. Right. Exactly. You can work for anyone. Mm -hmm. That's so yeah. true. Now, speaking of creativity, how do you stay creative personally? To be honest, I grew up my whole life thinking I wasn't creative, not just because I was like, not creative. Like people literally told me I wasn't creative and really? I was never going to be creative. And I don't know why that bothered me so much. Um, but I realized at a young age that I don't know if this was like something God told me or if this is something I just realized, mm -hmm. but whatever people tell you or whatever you have a strong feeling that you're not and you almost run away from it because it's such a strong insecurity, that thing is what you probably are most called to be and you have to find confidence in that. And so think, I mean, just think about it. What is like one of the most thing, uh, insecure parts of you? Like what are you constantly thinking about and you wish you were better at? it's probably something you're going to really flourish in one day. And so I think about that all the time when I'm creative directors, the word creative is literally in my job title. I get paid to be that word. <laughs> and it's like, wow, I never would have thought that as I was, I was a kid. And so I think to practice creativity, you have to first of all, believe that you're creative. And if you're not naturally creative, practice it practice being okay with showing your work to strangers and being in showing your work before it's finished and practice being able to try new things. Like don't be afraid to just stick to one thing that you know that works, try new things. And yeah, that's what's worked for me is to <clears throat> not be hurt by people's constructive criticism, but mm -hmm. just say I can be better and continuously trying 
Like some people think that it's just a natural thing to be creative, but it, it's kind of a lot of work. <laughs> you yeah. have to like read, you have to study, you have to watch what other people do. You have to expose yourself to different things and be confident that whatever you try is going to be good. And most of the time, that's the only way that something new is ever accepted. <laughs> right. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is so true. So, you know, that's from what I got out of that is, you know, you have to, you can't be afraid to put yourself out there. Yeah. Right. I mean, obviously, if, if you're young, you may be kind of afraid to talk to someone that may be older to you or express your creativity of a new idea that you have, whether you're in uh, a business that, you know, maybe you're in a lower position and you want to express this to someone that is mm -hmm. an executive. Um, mm -hmm. And you may feel like, you know, you're going to be shut down and, and whatnot. But I think part of that too is, is also not being afraid to fall on your face because yeah. you always learn from those experiences. But you, yeah. as long as you're willing to get better from that and move forward and take one step um, yeah. in front of the next, you're always going to grow. You're always going to get better, um, uh, yeah. whether you know it at that point or not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my biggest failures, and everyone everyone says, like, you, you have to fail. You have to fail every day. Well, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Failing to me... It doesn't have to mean like I did BVI Stronger series and not one person watched it. It's, it's like every day I fail. I start noticing I did that wrong. I did that wrong. I said that and I should have said this. I, you know, I told this person to do this and I really should have told that person to do this. It's like really count your failures because that's when you learn the best. And it, it sounds so cliche, but it really is. Like I, I had to learn the hard way how to be organized in editing. Mm -hmm. I would spend hours a week trying to replace missing files because I didn't understand, you know, how my organization, you know, was bad, but I take pride in being the most organized editor I've ever met and ever seen on YouTube <laughs> ever because I've gone through the pain of being so bad at it. And so it's like, don't beat yourself up for not understanding things and making all these mistakes because you could turn around and be excellent at it. Right. Yeah. Oh, that is so true. Now, would you also say that, you know, getting feedback for um, something that you did that maybe it was a mistake or whatnot is very important? Yeah, I think a lot of times people don't do that because they're afraid they're going to get their creative flow crushed and they're never going to be creative again. But it's like, for me, I just tie it to something bigger than myself and have mature conversations. Hey, I'm not going to throw disclaimers out the whole time because I'm going to be proud of my work, but I need you to meet me halfway and only give me criticism. If you have a suggestion for something better, like I have to tell people that all the time. I'm like, you know that I'm, I'm proud of my work, but I can still get hurt. And so if you're going to criticize it, please give me suggestions for better ideas and understand that I've put in X amount of hours and I might've already thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> so don't act like you know more than me when this is something I've been working on for a month. And, but I think it's absolutely critical that you have other people's feedback. You just have to make sure you don't let it crush you and be able to have conversations with people that don't know how to give constructive criticism. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. When you say the same, you probably have people, crit uh, you know, critique your oh, yeah. work and for how sure. do you handle that? Well, you know, um, Earlier on, you know, being a creative, you're yeah. so in tune with your work and you think it's like the best thing. Um, and then once you hear someone say, oh, that's, uh, that's, I don't know, it doesn't look too good. Then you, inside you just want to be like, oh, like, you know, why'd you say that? You're wrong. But like you said, being mature about it and actually thinking, okay, is, you're not taking it personally, I think. And just thinking like, you know, if it's if it's something that you feel is true and can actually help your work get better, then by all means, use it. But then if you kind of know that, okay, maybe they're just saying that it's it's not constructive, just let it let it pass. Let it pass. 
Um, and just having that um, ability to know the difference between each, I think that's very important as well. But definitely, uh, feedback is is very important. And be selective with who you, you know, intentionally ask feedback from. Don't ask right. from, from like random family members that have no idea what they're talking about because the most you're going to get is probably like, that was cool. You know, and it's like just not even worth your time. Like I always ask, I ask one person that works with me. I ask one family member that knows like, heart in it and knows what I'm trying to get across, which is usually Brittany because she works with me and she's a family mm -hmm. member. And then I ask one total outsider and I say, and I give them like, you know, I mean, they're not a stranger, but there's someone right. that does not know what I'm going for. And I say, what's confusing? What doesn't make sense? What's boring? And tell, and write down all those times that you feel those emotions and, and then write down what you remember at the very end of it. And then tell me what you thought the whole point of this was. And so I kind of give them guidelines to criticize it. That way I'm like, if the audio levels are off, I probably just haven't finished it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or, you know, if the subtitle was messed up, I probably just haven't finished it. Don't look at that. Look at these five things. Uh -huh. And uh, that is just probably the, the most useful thing that I've done when it comes to accepting feedback and criticism. That's, that's, um, that's a great thing that you said because – you know, the people th say like, you know, you, you can't, you have to be constructive, but what does constructive mean? And there's mm -hmm. two sides for each, you know, there's the people that are giving the const constructive criticism and then the ones that are receiving it. Yeah. And I like what you said by saying, okay, look at these specific things. Don't worry about the other things because mm -hmm. I already know that I have to fix those, but yeah. just give me feedback. And um, also getting feedback from different, uh, you know, different types of people, you yeah. know, the ones that know the uh, process yeah. and the ones that are outside. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's very important and something that can be applied um, to other yeah. filmmakers as well. Um, yeah. And yeah. this is coming from a, uh, <laughs> a long, like, learning the hard way and who not to ask and how to filter them. Definitely, you know, ask the wrong people before. So <laughs> after asking like hundreds of people, that's the best way to do it that I figured out. If mm -hmm. anybody else has a better way, I'd love to know. <laughs> I mean, you have to do that. It's all trial and error. You yeah. would never know unless you did it. Uh huh. So in terms of networking, uh, going mm -hmm. back to you, going out and contacting D-Rock yeah. um, because for a lot of people out there that want to know what, you know, how, how do you network? You know, what are some networking tips um, in terms of reaching out to people you want to collaborate or work with? Um, yeah. Can you tell me that process and how you did yeah. that? I live in Nashville and it's not LA. It's not New York. It's not Atlanta. It's, Nashville, it's a happening city, but there's not a lot of production here. And so I've definitely had to stretch in the networking area. It's been really hard for me to find people that do exactly what I do, but I don't know why anyone has a problem with it, including me, because there's literally so much opportunity with just Instagram and mm -hmm. just DMing people. I force myself, and I really don't force myself, but I, I make it a priority to be talking to 20 to 30 new people on Instagram every day. And that's whether it, whether that's, I find them or they find me, I make sure to respond to every single person that messages me because I have found the most incredible connections just through a simple DM and the power of having a network on social media is incredible. It's, it, I feel so like I have an army of people that, understand me and understand what I'm going for and are there for me to help them and them to help me just on social media. It's, I know when I put something out there, I'm, I'm going to get responses. And I know that if I, you know, see someone that I, I love their vision, like I'm going to reach out to them. And it's just crazy how we don't harness that. So I would encourage people to, Gary Vee says this all the time. Like if you're a new 
uh, if you're a new business owner and you're trying to get business and you're trying to network for that, or you're trying to network for to grow your, uh, just like friend group of creatives, it's look up the hashtags. People are using them, DM them, say, I mean, and, and try to add value to them. If they're like out of your network lead, like if, if they're more of a mentor, just say, can I work for you for free? Can I, can I provide you some kind of service for free? Can I do something for you? And so if you make a constant effort to do that, you're going to make some incredible connections and then just take it to the next step. Like, let's go get coffee. Let's, um, let's Skype sometime. Let's do a podcast. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. And that's exactly how it's done. You don't have to go to all these awkward events, carrying around a cocktail, trying to talk to people. I think that's like definitely going out of style. Like I love <laughs> meeting people face to face, but uh-huh. with the opportunity to meet people across, Across the world as quick as you can just do it and that's what happened with DRock like Brittany asked me if there was one person on earth that you would you know want to help you with this documentary who would it be and I was like DRock immediately <clears throat> and uh, she said message him on Instagram right now I said he's never gonna respond why would I do that I think I had like 3,000 followers at the time or something uh-huh. and now I have like 22 and so he might respond to me now, but at the time I was like, no. <laughs> and uh, I was like, totally irrelevant. And I basically just messaged him and I was like, hey, I really respect you. And I was just asked if there was one person in the world to help me with this, it'd be you. So I'm reaching out. And like, how would you like to help me with this? And gave him a little description of what it was about. And he responded and said, yeah, I'll help you. And I was like, okay. I was like, when can I come? To-? I was like, I'll, I'll come to you when. And he was like, oh, no, no, you don't have to do that. I was like, just send me your work and, uh, and I'll check it out. And I was like, this guy doesn't understand. I'm trying to get a documentary out in like two weeks. I'm trying to film, edit, and release a documentary in two weeks. I was like, no, 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 I'm going to come to you. And he was like, he fought me for it. He was like, you really don't have to. And I was like, I will be there tomorrow if you want me to. And I just kept pressing and kept pressing. Mm-hmm. And he was like, okay, meet me Thursday. It was Tuesday and I bought a ticket that night and met him for an hour in New York and then came right back. But that's a connection that I was willing to go above and beyond to have. And I'm going to have that forever. Like I still talk to T rock often Mm -hmm. and um, I talk to Gary often and, uh, and it's just like, that's what you have to do sometimes, but it's, it starts with just being brave and saying like, I'm going to go connect with people that are like-minded and, and then if they're above you, how can I serve you? How can, and then keep pressing in. Like, I just want to learn from you. What can I do for you to get that in return? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. And I'm glad that you talked about how you did it. Um, now, what would you say in terms of relationships and building lasting relationships in mm-hmm. this business? Um, how do you build lasting relationships, especially in like the business space? Lasting relationships. I think that's a difficult question for anyone. Yeah. Um, I think that business relationships are very similar to personal relationships in the sense that there is a company culture and there's an atmosphere that you are contributing to every day. And if you're not being intentional about adding to that atmosphere positively, then you're going to be a negative energy. You're going to be the person in the room that everyone notices in a bad way. And so I think just starting with what am I going to bring to the office every day? What am I going to bring to my coworker's life? And then obviously there are boundaries when it comes to personal relationships and and coworkers or your employees, Mm -hmm. but showing them that they care, that you care about them and being empathetic and um, actually seeing them as a person, not an employee or an intern or belittling them in any way and encouraging them and challenging them at the same time has been a technique or a, a way to interact with people in the office for me that has just been like, you, you got my back and I've got your back because I know you care about me mm-hmm. and on a personal level. 
And so to me, like those are going to be the long lasting relationships. The people that I know are on the same page as me. And this is not about, you know, who did the better video or like who had the better idea in the meeting. It's we're all trying to get to the same place. So how can we work together to get there? Having this long-term vision in mind, reminding ourselves of our values in the company and, and realizing that, you know, if she's being too selfish, we're not going to get here. And that hurts, that hurts us. So I think just like tying it to a larger goal in the office and being humble, seeing each other is what's going to make you feel like you trust each other and create long lasting relationships. Yeah, that is so true. Um, now would you say that, cause you can't get, you can't let e- ego get in the way, right? You know, yeah. that's, cause obviously, like you said, you, you have a one main goal, you're working as a team and you want to work together. Um, yeah. what have you learned working with a team, um, and building a team? I think that's what you were saying. You're currently building a team right now. Yeah. Um, what are some of the toughest things that you've experienced and what are some of the good things that you experience while working with a team and building a team at the same time? Well, at Ariel Produced, we, we love to encourage you to be entrepreneurial as an employee. So we want it to be very hands-off. I'm not holding your hand and showing you how to do everything. I want your creative ideas. I want your entrepreneurial spirit to take initiative and to to wear a lot of hats if you need to. And so with that, you know, comes people that are sometimes entrepreneurs. Sometimes people leave to start their own company. And what I think I've learned is that there's beauty in that. And in this industry of creatives, a lot of people leave to freelance. And so being okay with people having their own self-interest first before they before yours and your company is something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't have. It's because entrepreneurs, when you start a company, it's your baby, it's your life. And so you don't understand why other people don't commit their entire life to it. It's like, cause they have their own life to live. They have their own thoughts and ideas and dreams. And so what that's the biggest thing I've learned is just, you cannot be offended by people leaving and you have to be very appreciative of people who go above and beyond. Um, I mean, it's, and it's not worth it to have a large team if those people aren't on the same page as you. It's like, I would rather work alone than work with someone that is just trying to build a resume or just um, doing it for money. It's like, that's not why we're here. That we would be doing something way easier than this if we were doing this for money. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's definitely the biggest thing I've learned is just build a team that is on the same page as you and has the same values and wants to go the same place. Um, and it's really hard and it's taken a long time to do that and get it right. But once you get it right, it's like, man, I just have so much more peace in my life knowing that you have my back. And then if I can't do this, you're going to have my back and figure out how to get it done. Yeah. That, I mean, it, it's, it's a team team sport business is mm-hmm. for the most part even if you're yeah. a freelance you know you're still working with other freelancers yeah. um and you have one main goal in mind and you have to uh really find the people that fit with your company you can't yes. just hire people just for the sake of hiring them even if they may fit the criteria um for their role mm-hmm. but from what I've noticed and, you know, just talking to other people who run businesses and, and whatnot or part of businesses, um, I noticed that they would take the person that has better EQ, emotional mm. intelligence, mm-hmm. um, over the person that may be more qualified uh, yeah. for the job that doesn't have really good soft skills, for example. Someone that yeah. they would take someone that is that has a great attitude and open to learn because you can always teach them right if they have you know great attitude have you experienced that absolutely um a perfect example after 
we released the documentary, we were like, let's go hire some people because it's just us, just me and my sister. And so we put out um, some applications for a couple of job positions. And we expected probably like 20, 30 people to apply and to just pick somebody the next month. We had over 800 in two weeks. And I was like, where are these coming from? I got an email one day, woke up to an email from LinkedIn saying number one job. Like it was like top three jobs, like most sought after wanted jobs in Nashville. And I'm like, I had not applied to anything. I was like, it's not like this is an award. And Ariel produced was number two. And I was like, how did this happen? So what I (laughs) quickly, I was like, okay, there are some really great people on here and some really not great people that just aren't going to align with our vision. Um, And there were some incredible people that wanted to, you know, travel from across the country to come be with us. They were much older, much more experienced, but I just didn't feel right about it. And I was like, I'm just not ready for that. I need someone that's like, on the same page here that isn't just in this because it seems like a great opportunity to you know have some cool work and uh and so the way that i picked uh the two girls that work with us now is one of them her name's deanna (laughs) so we had like 700 applications and it's like really hard to get into our our office Mm -hmm. she brings me her resume like printed out in a book and I was like, how did you get up here? She's like, don't ask. And she like leaves. <laughs> and so she leaves me her resume. And if I read it and I'm like, oh, I have like 700 applications to go through. I don't know how to pick. And um, she ends up emailing me every week for like three weeks. And I never read any of them because I just had a lot of people to look at. And uh, her last email said in the, cap- in the subject line, work for you for free. And I was like... <laughs> click. <laughs> and I was like, of course I'm going to read that. And, um, she wasn't the most experienced. She's a year or two older than me. And, uh, she had just gotten out of college. And so she's like new to the business world. And, um, but I could tell that she was very willing to learn that she was a hard worker. She, she pursued this job. This wasn't just a one-time thing. And And I could tell she was just willing to figure it out. And that's like the best thing you could ask for because their job's going to change. And why would you want to invest in someone long-term if you can't trust them? If you know that they're not someone that can handle their own, if, you know, if I have to leave for BVI for a week, how, like, who's going to be able to, to hold down the fort. Mm -hmm. And so we hired her over the guy that has been doing this for 20 years because it's what we needed. You know, I mean, sometimes you need somebody that just has more experience than you. Like I think in, in when you're hiring for C-suite, probably shouldn't just hire for EQ. <laughs> like you're having yeah. leaders in the company. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes to, to starting companies like this, I want someone who has the heart and who has the, the EQ to, hand, to manage people that are more experienced than them. Um, and so that was very important for me. And I picked her over 800 other people um, wow. because she had those qualities and she was, you know, she's patient. She, I found out later on, she didn't have a job for the first eight months out of college because she was waiting for the job that she had in her mind. She had no grid for that was going to help make a difference and bring her fulfillment. And it's like, what 23 year olds actually think about that? And are that patient? Cause uh-huh. so many people, so many people tell you just get a job, you'll figure it out. And it's like so normal for people to do that. So it says a lot about her that she was willing to wait. And then it's not about the money for her. Like she would have taken a job at any pay after she's not being paid for eight months. Um, if it's the right job. Yeah. I, I really like her persistence and, you know, that's like what you said. Some people right out of college, um, I mean, ob- obviously, granted, they, they might need the money at that point. But yeah. if if you're in a situation where you have, um, you know, some space yeah. uh, and able to take the time to actually pursue the job that you really want, uh-huh. and if you really want it bad enough, um, like uh, the one that you hired, mm-hmm. then 
you have a better chance of getting that job or some job close to that some job yeah. that offers you fulfillment like you said because that's very important mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah absolutely so when it comes to running a video production company uh-huh. it, video production is art right and you're also running a business so yeah. how do you balance that mm, how do you balance art with business mm-hmm um, that is something I'm figuring out every day because Errol produced is a company that there's no template for. I've never seen a company that does what we're trying to do and still act as a for-profit. Uh, so we sound a lot like a nonprofit, but we do for-profit work for real estate, for, uh, entrepreneurs, for, um, a lot of causes that we want to promote. And so we essentially were founded to only use media as the greatest tool on earth to expand and create culture out of an idea or something that you want to share for companies that want to make a difference for people that want to make a difference and for causes that we care about. And so that is the challenge for me to figure out how can you become the most, the highest in demand company because that's your niche and that's the only kind of person client that you'll take um and so i think that mixing art with that is is kind of the same thing it's like you want to be artistic you want to be free but you also have to do what makes money and so if you can create a way to do that and to show that then it really like you've won <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah that, that's that's so true. And I think also um picking and choosing the clients that you want to work with. Yeah. Right? Like you said, in the beginning, yes, um I think it's okay to do some projects just mm-hmm. to get some experience in doing it, but over time you eventually want to find your niche um and I think your niche is working with great organizations that, you know, want to make a positive change a positive impact in the world. And as long as you stay with that niche, it's, it's really interesting because I think eventually you, more companies, more organizations that are within that start filtering in and and coming to you. And you might think, okay, how am I going to get this company? How am I going to get this organization? How can I work with them? But for some reason, uh, I'm sure you experienced this too. um, You know, you get those calls and you get those contacts in and yeah. those are the ones that you want to work with. Yeah. I mean, I think setting, you know, being in a niche in business is a great idea in the first place, but definitely if you're trying to do something on purpose and you're being intentional with your business, you've got to find a niche and you've got to say, no, like this is the standard. I've got to get really good at what I do so that you want me to work for you. Um, but I just think that media is is so powerful and anyone that works in it obviously likes to create and to see what they've created and to be proud of that. And so it's why would you continue to do all these jobs for that you don't want to do and be promoting things that you don't care about when you could be you know, essentially like creating culture to be the way you want it to be and creating work that matters and I guess that might just be me, but I don't understand why anyone would do work that they're not extremely proud of or that makes them fulfilled. And so that's what I'm trying to do is figure out how you can do that, how to select your clients. And at what point can you move from just taking all these jobs to being in this niche and being really specific about who you work with and Mm -hmm. what you put out there? Yeah, well, I think you're doing a great job and you and your team are doing a great job Thank telling you. those stories for, you know, all those people and all, all those organizations. Um, now, what's your why? Why do you continue to film and create? Um, that's a long answer. Yeah, <laughs> <And> I, I know. <laughs> I continue to film and I continue to create because that is what I think Um, is the best way I can live my purpose and how I can help people is to share their stories and to promote uh, what's good in the world. So people 
can have a new standard to look up to. I think I've been extremely bothered by culture and society and things that are normal when you go to these other countries and you say, that wouldn't be a problem in a million years here. I would never think of that as a problem. And now we use social media as this outlet for us to complain or to, to judge or to feel insignificant. And it's like, no, social media can be a place where you can, you can amplify everything that you want the world to see. And it's like, until that's normal, we're going to continue to use it in all these horrible ways. And so my why is to just amplify what's good and change culture to uh, be what I want it to be what I want it to be. I mean, it's insane what's socially acceptable across the world. And why is it socially acceptable? Because they see everyone else doing it. Because no one has said, that's wrong. Look at America. Look at this other country. You would never do that to your child. You would never treat a woman like that. You would never treat a child like that. And I think until <clears throat> other people can watch media and they can see what is normal and recreate that normality in their brain, they're going to continue to be abused. They're, continu they're going to continue to be uh, put in these situations that are normal for them and live a horrible life. And so I want to be uh, creating a new standard for those people and creating a new normal for those people by telling other people's stories and inspiring them and motivating them to create a new normal for their life. Yeah, that, that's powerful. I love that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So a couple more questions and we'll wrap this up, but it's been great so far. Great. A lot of great things that you were able to share. Um, so what would be one advice that you would give to your younger self? Um, something that you've probably experienced now that, you know, you would like to share. Man, I think that I would tell myself to be confident in your decisions. And so when I was 18, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew if I just put myself out there and I figured things out, I would come to some conclusion, but I was way more concerned with how well am I doing this? Like, am I good at this? What am I good at? I'll do that. And it's like, dang, I really didn't know what I was doing. So I would tell myself, go meet a lot of people, try a lot of different things, fail at a lot of things to figure out what you really want to do. Don't go just by what people told you you should do or told you that you're good at. And uh, just being more confident in, in that you will figure it out and that you're capable of finding answers to these things that, s that seem unsolvable is so important. Yeah. Oh, man, that's great. Um, you know, that's um, we tend to get sidetracked sometimes, right? And yeah. we kind of maybe question ourselves whether – the path that we're on is the right path, but yeah. no one can tell the future. But like you said, you have to be confident in yourself yeah. first and foremost. Um, and just go along with the process, you know, not, not really yeah. worrying about the end outcome, but just enjoying the journey, uh, like you yeah. said, and making sure that you're getting better, uh, mm -hmm. each and every day. Um, yeah. so what's in it for you in terms of the future? as a filmmaker, as a person running your business, something you'd like to share? What's in it for me? Uh, like, what are my plans? Yeah, what are your future plans? Big goals, big dreams? I am honestly taking it day by day. I have always thought of my life five to 10 years in advance, and that's been great. You know, when you're in high school, don't make decisions that you don't want, you know, to be part of your track record in five years. <laughs> and the same thing goes for college. But now I am just in the habit of taking opportunities. And every day there's a new opportunity. Take it, you know, go do it. Go push yourself out of your comfort zone. And that's going to lead you to meet some person that's going to change your life for the rest of your life. And so put yourself out there. Be willing to take opportunities and try new things. 
And like I said, be confident and understand that you are capable of solving problems that you feel like are impossible if you really try. And so for me, I'm just going to continue to be where I am used best and where I'm learning the most. Um, I'm 21 years old. I have a lot to learn before I consider myself an expert at anything. And so I am definitely into humbling myself and working for free and staying late here and uh, serving in any way I can right now because one day I, I want to do my own thing and I want to be uh, successful in that and know that I learned the most from the people that were above me and that were leading me and I was respecting that. So yeah, that's just where I'm at. I'm just like hungry to learn and willing to take opportunities and push myself out of my comfort zone. Yeah. I mean, we're always learning, right? And that's why I wanted to get you on this podcast because I've definitely learned a lot from what you had to say, um, especially some new tips and and advice that hopefully um, anyone that's listening to this podcast cast will um, definitely benefit from. So yeah. thank you once again, Callie, for right. taking the time and being on this podcast and sharing your story. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you again, Callie, for sharing your story on this podcast. And thanks again for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I'll be putting Callie's social media info down below in the description so you can stay updated on her latest posts. And if you got great content out of this episode as well, make sure to give it a thumbs up if you're watching or give it a great review if you're listening on the podcast. So thanks again for joining in. And until next time, I'll see you in the next episode. Peace.